Good morning, everyone. I hope you've enjoyed the Greek art we've looked at so far. And I think I just want to remind you all that when it comes to this period in history and moving forward, time stops becoming linear. That is to say, we do have definite demarcations in style, but there's also overlaps. And this is particularly on the temples because sometimes you'll see one or two different styles on one temple or one pediment that are maybe 10 years apart. And it could have to do with who the actual sculptor was or you know their influences at the time. So I'm gonna show you a little bit of that today. So we're gonna start in this lecture with archaic period sculpture. And I've talked to you last time about the fact that the Greeks define what it means to be Greek in terms of humanism, in particular themselves, as opposed to other cultures. And in the archaic period, they really begin to refine this definition of what it means to be Greek in their art. And so during this particular period, and remember, this is sort of arising out of first the geometric period when they're just starting to sort of catalog things. And then the brief orientalizing period, which was really a good name for influences from other cultures that are coming into Greek art. And of course, always when there's this rich cultural interchange, there's things they keep and things that morph and change as the years go by. But in the archaic period, they begin to really look at ethos. And remember, we talked about ethos and pathos, emotion versus, I guess the emotion versus reason is a very broad and loose way of putting it. But the concept of ethos in particular is best illustrated in what's called Koros figures, which we'll look at today. Koros is an archaic Greek statue of a young man or boy. And as you'll see, we do break that rule a little bit because we do have one example of an early classical Koros statue, but that is the way of art history. So we're gonna begin in Delphi, and we've already been to Delphi once. And if you remember, Delphi is up here. Now, also, here is a, a town of Rias, which is actually in the bottom of the boot of Italy. But remember, the Greeks extended their influence over to Italy and over to Asia Minor. Here's Troy, here's Pergamon, and Knidos. Knossos, of course, is down here. So all of this area, here's Thess Thessaly and Samothrace up here, here's Thrace and Macedonia. So again, Greek culture is rich and varied because there's many, many different individual cultures on all these little islands. So let's start with architectural sculpture just briefly. And I talked to you last time about the parts of the temple and here's a picture of a pediment. And this is actually a diagram of the temple of Artemis, which is on Corfu. And the archaic period goes between 600 to 480 BCE. And we really begin the importance of sculptural decoration. But notice on this pediment, we've got sort of these paired lions with the figure in between them. So this is an old motif. And pediment architecture begins to become very important as well because it's a really good shape, if you will, or a good design to make stories on because of the shape of the triangle. So you can see the pediment art up here, the sculpture, and this is the frieze here, the treasury of the Siphnians, which was at Delphi, and you, you remember each different city-state had its own treasury in the complex at Delphi. So this was originally filled with relief sculpture on the frieze and in the pediments, and it has these caryatid columns which are unusual. We also begin to see the Ionic order here, and you can notice the Ionic order, notice these two little volutes on the top of these caryatid columns. They're balancing these carved capitals on their head, but the entablature itself, remember the entablature is this whole part on the top, and the Ionic order is just a very plain architrave, which is this part up here above the columns, and then a continuous carved frieze, and then it's very set off by these beautiful 
beautifully, richly carved moldings. So the Ionic versus Doric versus Corinthian order is very specific in terms of what is in the architraves and what is in the friezes. This is just an example of the sculpture on the north frieze of the treasury of the Siphnians. So that part that we just looked at above those columns, above the architrave. This is really the earliest known example of a trend toward a natural representation of space. And so you can notice here, there's actually figures overlapping. See this man here and he's reaching his arm in front of this other man. So this other man is going behind him. The three shields here are overlapping. And there's action, there's movement, this battle of one against the other. And so this is the battle between the gods and the giants when Greece was created, the world was created. So as I've said, pediment art is a very good format for storytelling. They of course had their own design issues. This is a reconstruction drawing of the east pediment of the temple of Aphia in Aegina. And it's around 480 BC, so a little bit later. And so there's a solution here. See these, see these figures? on the corners, these are dying warriors, or you know, some people just call them reclining figures, although it's accepted that they're probably dying because they probably wouldn't be taking a nap during battle. But this solution of putting these dying warriors becomes a standard in pediment art. And see the two archers, this archer here, you know, sort of guarding this one and the, the, as they face each other coming together in the middle. So this is a sculpture here. It's on a very separate slab and then installed in the pediment space. So if you look at this diagram, and of course this pediment doesn't have Medusa in it, but notice, see how there's, there's these sort of slots or lines. And each of these sculptures would be carved out on separate slabs. And then they put them up and they end up and install them in the pediment space. So they're very high relief figures. They're breaking right through the architectural frame. The undercarding goes all the way behind it. So it's almost as if they're just ready to just jump off of there. And you have to remember these temples are very tall and that you're looking at them from underneath. So they have to stick out enough that the viewer could see the figures. Medusa is one of the three winged Gorgons. She has snakes instead of hair. And if you look at her, you turn to stone. So I'm gonna to talk to you now about the Koros figures. So those were examples of pediment art or architectural sculpture. And you can extrapolate from the few images I showed you, all of the architectural sculpture that is possible to look at. We could spend an entire semester on each one of these little things I've shown you, but this is a survey course, so I just can show you a few examples of each thing. So now we're going to turn to archaic freestanding sculpture, and most of the examples we have of this kind of sculpture are these Koros figures. And they could be made of wood, they could be made of terracotta or white marble. Um, possibly they made them of other materials that didn't last, but these are the ones we have. They're generally life size or larger, and they're generally standing up or striding forward. So this image shows you a frontal view of a Koros figure, and then it also shows you from the back and the side, so you can get a sense of what he looks like from the front and the back. These represent a concept. So again, remember we talked about the Greeks, they're the first people to think about thinking, which means that their art becomes conceptual. So here is this concept of a superior man who is in control. So we have this visual illustration of ethos, of reason, and arete, which is perfection, or the perfect man. And so, they illustrate the concept of ethos through a process called idealization, that they want to make the forms and figures attain perfection. And so this always is based on cultural values and the image of the artist. And so you always want to remember that the ideal of beauty for one culture might be very different than that for another, or the ideal of perfection or humanity might be different from one to another. So the Greek ideal may not be the ideal for the Egyptians or the Romans or Americans or Canadians or Confucian Chinese. So for the Greeks, 
The representation of a beautiful body equals a beautiful mind and a beautiful soul. That what is within is reflected in what is without. So the early chorus figures, and some of them have this very slight smile that I'll get into, but, and I don't know why this one is called the New York Chorus, but that's what the slide had it labeled as. And again, there's many of these, so I try, I'm trying to show you a little bit of a variety of them. So, the Greeks associate these young athletic males with fertility, with family continuity, with perfection, with what we're going to call arete, which is excellence. And you can see now that they've begun to study anatomy. So it's almost as if these just begin to appear because up until now, we really have not had any of this attention to detail in anatomy. So it's clear that the need to depict this, these figures that are in these games, and remember, you know, we saw this stadium at Delphi, that these athletic games are very, very important to the Greek culture as well, that they're representing this idealization, if you will. So some of the key to understanding this can be found in this story. So these are two chorus figures that that were made around the same time as that New York chorus. And they came, they are found in Delphi. And they have a story with them. And it was written by Herodotus, who was a Greek historian. And he wrote that their mother wanted to attend this festival in order of the, in um, honor of the goddess, but the oxen didn't show up. So they didn't want their mother to miss this festival. Remember that honoring the gods was above all else for the Greeks, the way they lived. So Cleobus and Beton, the these two, or Cleobus and Byton, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce them, but anyway, they hitched themselves up to this cart instead of the oxen. So it's a cart that took four oxen. It was, you can imagine that it was all the stuff they need for that long journey, or mother, the servants, all the food, cooking stove, pot, bedding, you know, not just a matter of just carrying their mother, but all the stuff that would have to go with her for this long festival to where she was going to stay there. So it was a big task for them to drag this thing all the way there. And plus it's mountainous in Greek, so they're going up and down mountains and this with this cart with the wooden wheels on it. So it's an act of strength, it's an act of piety. And it won the respect of everyone at the festival, deeply touched the spirit of their mother. Oh, these two perfect young men, they're so strong they could do this. They're so pious that they did this. Their mother prayed to Herod to grant them the best gift that they could possibly get. So try to think what would Hera give them? What's the greatest gift you could give somebody for the greatest sacrifice to the gods? Well, it wasn't riches, fame, or glory. What it was, was they went to sleep, they never woke up, they died in their sleep. And this is because they passed from life at the high point of their life. They had achieved perfection. So they were given this gift of knowing that when they reached, you know, wherever it was they were going, that they were perfect, that they had reached all that they needed to attain physically, mentally, and spiritual in the life of humans. So there was no reason for them to live any longer because there was nothing more for them to accomplish. So uncertainties of life no longer have a hold on them. And remember, this is very, very important to the Greeks that uncertainty, that chaos, at this time, they want to hold chaos at bay. They want control. They need to make sure that everything's going to be all right, if you will. So they're immortalized as heroes in these figures. And I leave it to you. I've said this to you before, that you could go to Delphi today and you could see Cleobus and Beton and you could know their story. So it's a representation, as I've said, of the superior man who's in control. All of these figures are visual illustrations of arete, which is perfection, and ethos, which is reason, which is control, which is living life by reason and not allowing chaos or emotion to guide what you're doing. So the artist uses idealization to achieve this. So in the figures of Cleobus and Beton or any of these striding chorus figures that they're 
representing a beautiful body and in so doing they're representing a beautiful mind and a beautiful soul because all of these things are inextricably interwound into one. So we have this concept, this concept of a young hero who is a warrior that maybe died in battle or an athlete that's accomplished the highest honor in Greek society like Cleobus and Biton. So that is the embodiment of this ethos. So their character is shown through their actions. So we have this visual code for representing excellence. And this visual code is areta. The code of areta, the code of excellence is depicted through the young, athletic, nude, male, Greek body. And all of these things together illustrate the concept of excellence. So it's not just a nude man, but it's the quintessential ideal of humanity is embodied in this image. But what are they actually doing in this idealization? They're reducing the forms of the body, at least to begin with. And in a way, this is kind of how we learn, right? So they, in the earliest chorus sculptures, like this is a very early one, look at the date. This is 600 BCE. Some of the ones that I've already shown you are a little later. So we have very simple, repeated shapes. And the figure is youthful, it's the closed form. So he's striding forward, but just as one small step, it's not about the action, it's just about, you know, he's coming toward us, but it's much like the Egyptian sculpture in terms of this one foot forward, and I'll show you a comparison in a minute. The hair is always these repeated bead-like shapes, and the face has no emotion. And even when we go into the figures that have what we call the archaic smile, it's a limited emotion. It's an otherworldly, it's a figure that exists beyond emotion because even though we're representing the human figure this is an idealization of humanity a quintessential male rather than one specific person so the person portrayed he's beyond this world so he's beyond emotion so this is the anavisos koros and it's a little bit later notice it's 525 bce has a very notable athletic quality to it you see and so you can see in that the Greeks have begun to learn a little bit about anatomy. We can see the articulation of the muscles. We can see the back muscles. We can see, you know, where the hip, where the hip socket is, where the knee socket is, even the ankles, the articulation in the wrist. So this is the frontal view of the Anavisos Koros. And because it's a metaphor for perfection, the Koros figures are represented as nude. And as we've said, it's an illustration of excellence, of beauty, of mind, of body, or spirit. So as they become more skilled, they're better able to render these muscular, well-proportioned bodies. And so we see, again, some of these figures are shown this, what we call this archaic smile, which is a little bit of an attempt to animate the features. It's also showing this otherworldly emotion. But you can see in this figure how well they're beginning to understand anatomy. We can see the delineation of the rectus abdominis here, muscle here, of the shoulder blades, of the hip sockets, of the knee sockets, the proportion between the head, the figure. And these proportions for the body become very strict. So if you look at this Koros figure compared to Menkaros, and this is the Menkaros from exactly the same time period, we can see some differences. So the Menkaros figure, they're both stepping forward. They're both proportioned similarly, although this, this one's a little bit more naturalistic in his depiction. If you notice the proportions between the torso to the shoulder, the head is a little bit better proportioned. Menkaros's head is very small, but also, this figure is completely cut away from the stone. It's more naturalistic. It's the Menkaros figure. Most of these Egyptian sculptures are within the stone. They haven't cut them away from the stone or made them freestanding. And it takes quite a bit of technical skill to be able to create a sculpture that will stand like this and not need the support of the stone.
Now, the female counterpart to the chorus figures is called a kore, which is an archaic Greek statue of a young woman. So their votive statues, or sometimes we call them commemorative statues, sometimes they honor maidens of exceptional virtue. She could have had an apple or a pomegranate in her hand. Usually these figures are figures that are extending offerings. So your book suggests perhaps she's pouring a libation. The point is that all of these Kore figures are clothed and they're generally offering offerings. So they're votive statues in a way that the male chorus figures are not. They're generally offering something to the gods or goddesses. She's named for this distinctive garment that she's wearing, which is called a peplos. And so we've got this same motionless vertical pose. We've got the archaic smile. We've got sort of this long beaded hair. We've got, you know, one foot slightly forward, although you can't really see it because she's got her skirt on. But the figure is more rounded. It's more feminine. These are examples of the archaic smile. So during this period in Greek art, the nude female body is not represented because the Greeks didn't feel that female nudity was appropriate, although male nudity was not only appropriate, but it's also necessary. That, and it's because the male nudity is elevated beyond the mere flesh, if you will. So the chores are creating offering, which are extension of their being, if you will. But the chorus figures are the embodiment of virtue within themselves. So the male counterpart doesn't need clothing because the nudity is the illustration of perfection. And of course, the clothing of the chore is ceremonial. It's also appropriate to the occasion. And I've put a link in here. If you're interested in this, there's more about it. You can click on this link. So a lot of the development of these figures really revolves around increasing information that artists can record about muscles and skeletal structure. But the Kore figure, the clothing, hides the body. So look at this Kore from Chios. She's at the right, and this garment she's wearing is called a chiton. And so the cloak is draped diagonally over it, and they're reflecting this trend toward lifelike depiction. But I want to talk a little bit about the drapery that we see on these female sculptures, because as we move forward, even into the Hellenistic, you're going to see very, very elaborate treatments of dra drapery. And part of that, I think, has to do with what I'm going to talk to you about, which really has to do with different approaches to male and female figures in Greek art in general. So here's the way to think about it is, a lot of the development of these archaic chorus figures, and you've already seen it, it has to do with the study and recording of informations about muscles and skeletal structure of the male figure by Greek artists. You don't see this with a study of the female figure at all. We see it in the male. And so, in the case of the Kora figures, you're seeing the focus on patterns of the drapery, the hair, and the clothing is completely hiding the body. And we just talked about that a minute ago in that one Kora figure that's stepping forward. You can't quite tell what she's doing. So the image of the Koros is analytical, whereas the imagery on the Kore, it's purely decorative in many ways. So this reflects different attitudes toward the sexes in general, in the social, the economic, and the legal practices of the period. And it's important to understand this. To be a citizen of a polis was central to the Greek identity. And however, citizenship is only open to free adult males. So the female had to be included in the polis. She's in, included as a member of society, obviously, she's there. But she's excluded from citizenship. She cannot be a citizen. She has no vote. She's understood as the other and as the antithesis of the free male citizen. And this fits into the Greeks seeing the world through the perspectives of a series of binaries or antimonies. And we talked about this too, that Greeks view themselves through the lens of themselves against another group, that they define themselves by what they're a member of. So Greek versus barbarian, male versus female, free versus slave, human human versus animal, human versus barbarian, Greek versus barbarian. So 
This establishes this privileged position of the Greek male, if you will, and this nudity of the male in Greek art is a sign for the male citizen. They have regular practice. Young men are exercising in the gymnasium in the nude. Women always were discreetly covered in public. They didn't go to the gym and exercise in the nude. And likewise, it was understood as a contrast to men in ancient societies who would have been deemed barbaric by the Greeks. So this is the Kore from Chios at the right. And this points out what I just talked to you about, which is the fact that there's this decorative interest. This, the female is the other, that she is offering a votive offering, that she is shown in a very different way than the male is.